a moment to uh, to get in here. All right, so yeah, hello and welcome. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, on behalf of Smart Dolphins, I uh, just want to say thank you for you know joining today's uh, cybersecurity awareness uh, training. My name is uh, Ty Hedden. I'm one of the VCIOs uh, here at Smart Dolphins. Uh, that stands for Virtual Chief Information Officer. So uh, basically, I help with you know, long-term guidance and, and planning for businesses. Um, Smart Dolphins itself is a managed IT service provider uh, based here in Victoria, uh, but we serve small and medium-sized businesses uh, all throughout uh, BC. Um, you know, those with satellite offices and everything uh, in between. Uh, basically, we're, you know, uh, just in, uh, a complete outsourced IT solution for, you know, a business that needs help desk and project work and high level guidance and, you know, uh, all of the hardware and security and antivirus and all that sort of stuff that goes into healthy IT. Uh, we provide that all as a, a package. And we're always um, looking for new ways to serve our clients and the broader business community. Uh, it's with that goal in mind that we've brought today's uh, session to you. And we always have other sessions going on as well. Um, so if you head to smartdolphins.com slash training, uh, there's a more extensive list, but a couple of highlights here. Uh, we have a Microsoft Planner session coming up on December 2nd, um, and also uh, an uh, Adobe uh, Acrobat Beyond the Basics uh, session on December 8th. Uh, we also have a Microsoft Word uh, Beyond the Basics session on Microsoft, or sorry, on <laughs> Wednesday, uh, the December 14th. All right, and as a quick note as well, um, if you do have any uh, questions today, just pop those into the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on those. Uh, I'll do my best to answer anything I can immediately, um, but anything else, uh, we do have some question and answer time uh, set aside for the end of the session where Sonia and I uh, can spend a bit of time with you and uh, go through any questions. Uh, you'll also receive a link to the recording today, um, as well as a uh, very quick feedback survey to let us know how we're doing, uh, You know, if there's anything that really resonates with you or something that we might be able to cover in more depth. All right, with all of that covered, um, it's an honor to introduce uh, Sonia Goulet, uh, president of Infinity Cyber. Sonia is an international cybersecurity educator, innovator, and strategist. Sonia has worked with the National Guard, the U.S. State of Homeland Security, the Michigan State Police, and many more. She has dedicated her career to helping cybersecurity professionals to better detect and prevent cyber attacks in real-world settings, and is now focusing on educating employees on safe online business practices. Sonia joins us from her home in High River. Take it away, Sonia. Thank you very much, Ty. I appreciate that. Uh, nice to be here with everyone today, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. I will make sure I keep it interesting, but informative. I'd like you to be able to leave this session with some nuggets of information that you can use from today on. And uh, and then, then if there's other things that you need more information on, I'd love to be able to help you with that as well. So we'll cover today some of the basics, right? So what is cybersecurity awareness and why does it matter? And why am I here? What do I need to learn? And so there's a few things that are really critical in your day-to-day -day work that we want to be able to cover with you just to give you a full understanding and kind of a, you know, an overview and then kind of down to the weeds of what that looks like for you at your job, in your role every day and how this applies to you. So we'll cover basic foundations, uh, common threats, uh, some of the ways to secure your work environment, uh, best practices, and then, you know, some of the hybrid work checklist things that you would have to consider. So cybersecurity is confusing. I have a lot of people that I, like a lot of my friends, as soon as I say cybersecurity, their eyes glaze over. So it is somehow, some way meant to, uh, not meant to confuse you, but it does. And so we want to really just help you today understand some of the things that are happening right now out there that seem to be hitting the headlines over and over and over and over again. And really, you know, that's a, such a huge impact to us in so many ways. And we're gonna bring it down to how it impacts your small organization or your medium organization. Cause some of these headlines are talking, you know about big organizations, but it's also applicable to you. So 
This is someone putting money under a mattress. So we have this little interactive slide uh, questionnaire thing called Slido. And Slido will use uh, your phone. If you could grab your phone right now and you can put your phone up to this QR code uh, up on the screen and it will pop the question up on your phone. So if you don't mind having some fun with me for a moment, take that, scan that QR code and the question will come up. How many of you save your money under your mattress today? So some of you, do some of you save all of it, none of it, or do you use the institutions, whatever bank there are? Uh, I'm just curious because the last few months people have gotten a little bit um, nervous about some of the banking systems, but. So not very many put their money under the mattress and rightly so, right? I know that, you know, my grandparents would have talked about that kind of measure of saving money. And it wouldn't have made sense to me as a kid, but there's there was different resources to them back then, right? So they didn't have a lot of money and they didn't have access to the resources we have now. So they didn't feel as secure with the money they did make as to where to keep it safe. And so now we're at this day and age where we have institutions, we have banks, we have all sorts of firms out there that save our money, invest our money, uh, hold our mortgages that we trust, right? So we figured out measures in which we can utilize different organizations to keep our assets secure, our physical assets, which, which is our money. And so a bank is one of them, right? So we don't necessarily need to use a mattress, right? And the concept of it seems kind of archaic. Uh, but there were a time, there was a time where people actually thought that was a valid way to protect and save their money. So today we're going to talk about the idea around what to secure for you outside of your physical assets. So we secure our home, we secure our money, we secure our children, our health. But now we have to talk about our digital assets. And that is everything that you touch on your computer everything that you interact with as soon as you log on to your computer. And that has value as well. And that has, a, um, I would say, confidentiality. It has to be protected. And we're going to talk about why that matters to you. So I'm going to give you a couple of terms to know, because I really think it's critical that you understand these terms because they can confuse you otherwise they, uh, why, they, um, why one, week happens to, one thing happens to the other. So first of all, malware. So malware is a malicious software that's a, it's a, typically a catch-all term referred to doing damage to any single computer, server, computer network, or software. So you're today, you're with me on a computer, you're using the Zoom software, and then you log on to your work applications, which is all software, whether it's cloud-based software or whether it's on-premise but it's still an application that you're using to do your work, whether you're logging into using it for HR, accounting, or just email. So you using very um, diverse, but also uh, maybe even some similar applications between all of you, you would probably all be familiar with Outlook on Office 365, for example. So that's one application. So you're very familiar with using different software and different devices and different applications for the type of work you need to do. And so we also hear this term data breach. It also could be called data loss, um, data leak, uh, and, and cyber incident. And all of these all encompass the same thing, more or less, just to keep things simple. And it's a breach of exposing confidential, sensitive, protective inf protected information. So those are pieces of data that you touch every day that might be confidential. So that again could be anything. So just think about what do you touch in a given day? So are you are you in accounting software and you're doing budgets or are you cutting checks for staff or are you um, interacting with vendors and doing invoicing and transactions or new business with them or products? So all of this has different um, types of data, but it's still considered data. So all of that that you touch every day, is now called, essentially it's called data. And that data now has value. And it has been 
a very interesting revelation over the last couple of years of how much that's changed and escalated into our work life. So as you would have said, oh yeah, I've been working for numerous years, email, non-issue, uh, HR software, no issue, accounting, uh, doing accounting, non-issue. Well, I have to bring this to light now is it is now an issue. The way we interact with our software, in turn, our data has now a different level of security that we have to consider. And we might not have considered it a couple of years ago, but the way that the landscape's changed, we are forced to look at the way we interact with this, the data we touch, our client information, or, or any customer information for that matter. And you, whatever data you touch, now actually is important data that you touch. It may have, you may have realized, oh, it is important, but now I'm telling you, it has a whole different level of importance to organization outside of you, but to hackers. So who are the hackers? Hackers are, they're individuals they're organized, or they're nation state. Now, nation state is something that is very sophisticated, organized outside of our country, usually meant to do harm and attack your organization to steal your data. They are resourceful. They have nothing but time. And their primary focus is to be able to get into your software, grab your data, and steal it from you. And so you now wouldn't have realized that you have somewhat this, you know, we call this a, somewhat of an enemy, but they're out to do harm, even though you're just interacting with financial software, for example, your work is harmless. You, you are a small organization and you're just doing right by your client and right by your team. However, there's a whole new level of threat that has come upon small and medium organizations in those last couple of years, and it's only escalating. And so what we know now is we're starting to compile a lot more data that has a lot more heavy hitting numbers. And right now, just to give you a, a few notable stats, 58% of attacks are against small organizations. And that means an organization like you, yours. And that would usually cost an average of 141,000 um, of downtime of a single attack. And so a single attack would mean, you know, you can have, you know, let's say you have your fire in your home and it causes damage to a lot of rooms in your home. Well, then you can't use your space, right? It has to get repaired. That's the same idea. You're going to have an organization that's going to be shut down and can't be used because of this type of attack. It really does change the landscape of the way you do business because you can't afford to be offline or not do business with your clients for one day or two days or three days. But this is actually what's happening if a company does get a type of cyber incident occur within their organization. So it's something to consider what you're up against now, because now you're looking at a whole different aspect of a challenge in running your day-to-day -day business or the work you do every day. And then it also takes an average of 206 days to even know that you have a breach inside of your organization or a data loss or a data leak. So there's challenges there that are up against all organizations. So it's not just, you know, you individual, but every single organization is vulnerable to this now. And it is becoming more and more common and more and more current. And there's no differentiator anymore because just like you or I can go to Hawaii and we can go log on and do our work for the week, the beautiful joys of remote work, that has extended your work environment, your, you know, your perimeter of working inside of cloud applications that allow you to do work anywhere you wish, right? But that also means that your connectivity also allows hackers to have the same connectivity except they're a little bit more stealth. They know how to access systems that have certain vulnerabilities to it that you wouldn't have ever thought there was. And so you're just looking at the fact that you had ease of access to do the work you're doing because of the pandemic. And now we're faced with different challenges because ease of access is not the only challenge. We now have to secure our access because accessing it now means it's not only us that is able to access our software. It means the uh, malicious actors out there are also aiming to access your software or your client uh, 
credentials or your client information. It depends on what client information you hold, but a lot of that client information is very valuable now. Um, so we'll talk about a few of the common threats that may, that affect you in your day-to-day -day work and then how that breaks down to apply to you. So phishing is here to stay, and I'm sure many of you have heard of it, right? It's a type of a social engineering tack where someone pretends to be someone you think you know, and they're trying to bait you by email, usually email. It's become extensive to phone calls or um, video or um, texting. It's becoming um, everywhere. It doesn't seem to be going away in any any way that we can recognize, and it's getting trickier. They're getting creative and they're changing their methods over and over and over again. So what we do know is it is going to be the way that we have to approach our business every day to know we have to expect this. It can't be surprising. We have to just know what's going to happen. But what does that mean? What is going to happen, right? So a phishing email is a phishing email, but it actually does have some punch behind it, right? It's carrying that malware inside that email and that that I that definition I told you. And again, it's complicated and technical how they do that, but essentially they're going to give you a link in that email or they're going to give you a attachment in that email. And all of those are ways to get you to kind of cater to what they want you to do. Hey, go change this password. Hey, we know something about you. You have to do this for us. They're going to just find any which way that's going to work. And so we know this is now going to be your new day-to-day -day challenge. And so we want to be able to prepare you as to really what are you looking at, what to expect. And, and right now we have 36% of breaches in 2021 uh, involved phishing. And so these breaches are getting bigger and bigger and more common, and those numbers are only going to go up. So how do they do this? Well, it is because everything is online. We are everywhere. So our company has a, a website. It has website uh, address, phone numbers, email addresses, sometimes even images of you, of your staff, your leadership. Just think about how um, transparent you are. Uh, you have social media sites. So all they have to do is just target Oh, we're going to choose healthcare, and they and healthcare is one of the primary targets right now in this window of time, and, and where they're finding it's the most vulnerable. And why is it most vulnerable? Because no one's expecting it, right? And so they're looking for okay, where's the what? What are the email addresses? So then they do this reconnaissance and they figure out who works there, and that's an easy find. We have LinkedIn profiles as well. We do have enough information for these hackers to be able to retrieve enough data to be able to find all the publicly available information that would give them enough ammo to be able to, to launch a, we call it a phishing campaign. And with that, their objective is to get you to respond to them. Respond to them via email, click on the link, or download the attachment. So they send out a mass campaign. So they'll send it to all your employees. And then all they have to have is one person click on that, and then they get to get inside your network. And again, it's it's like a virus. It has a very specific purpose. You don't know how to stop it once it once it once it is in, and you might not recognize that it's there and doing what it's doing because it's stealth. And so it's pretty confusing and challenging because it's not going to be what you see. And so I, and that's the most unfortunate thing. You don't realize that you clicked on something that had something in the background going to be essentially venomous and spreading outside, inside your network to do harm. Then there's also spear phishing, which also is getting more common and will not go away because it targets your bosses or C-suite level staff who have ability and access to confidential data, clients, banking, money, all of these things that can just allow them to get quick access to something that's high value to them, right? And high value and quick turnaround. And so if they can say, okay, uh, Sharon, your boss is gonna email you and he's gonna say, hey, can you send me the, um, the banking records for uh, X client? And you go, okay, that's weird. My boss doesn't usually ask for that but okay, I'll email him back that. That wasn't your boss. That was someone pretending to be your boss, but he knew 
what you would do if he sent that information to you because it all looked like a real email and you responded accordingly. So he's getting intel and he's getting more information and he got something that was confidential from you even though it was a hacker. So it gets very confusing the way that they will interact and try and confuse you to think there's something legitimate and it's not. And right now, 96 of those, uh, 96% 96, 96 of the email campaigns coming out there, they want three types of data is really what they're trying to retrieve. So they'll usually look for passwords, usernames, PIN numbers, maybe personal uh, data like names, addresses, email addresses, and then medical records. So it's the whole gamut of information that they would want to be able to retrieve and steal from your organization. So as you are probably listening, going, well, I don't have anything that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis that could be confidential. An email address is confidential. An email address has a lot of traction for a hacker uh, because then they can find everything else around that uh, because that's just their expert researchers, I guess you would say. And so they can find information that we wouldn't even realize that we have out there on us that could just collect all of these pieces to make it all one important piece for them to go, oh, I know where Sharon works. I know what Sharon does and I know how to trick her. So it's just ways and tactics that they can get around social engineering you to get the information they can steal from you. So here's an example of a phishing campaign that just happened last week to one of my clients. Now, it's a longer email. It's actually two pages. So they're not going to be, hey, change your password. There's that campaign, but there's this campaign. And this campaign is just long-winded. And to go over it briefly, He's basically threatening this client to say, I'm in your network. I'm laughing because I'm here and you didn't even know I'm here. And just so you know, I have access to everything. So don't try to, and then he threatens her by saying, don't go anywhere. Like, don't call the police or don't anything. But he says, I have downloaded all your personal data and your web browsing history, history and your photos. And then he says, I have access to all of your uh, social media email and contact list and everything. So he's basically just saying, you're my prisoner now. I have access to all of you. But then he goes on to talk about how he has explicit photos of them, of this person, and uh, basically trying to exploit them, assuming that's the kind of person that they were, like that they were having maybe dirty pictures on their computer, and now they're going to be exposed. So this hacker threatens them. So this hacker's name is John Merrill, which is not a human, at merrilltaxlaw.com. It's a fake email in every way, shape, or form. But this hacker comes with a punch, and he hits you on that emotional level where you, you go, well, I haven't done anything wrong, but what if? What does he have of me? Oh, my gosh, I should respond to this. I should do something to this because what if he shuts down my computer? What if he shuts down my email? Because essentially this is what this hacker is doing. He's essentially saying, do this or else I'm going to shut you down. And then you're going to be in real trouble. Now, this is just a hacker, probably in China, dropping a threat that's saying, um, cater to this phishing campaign, essentially. And then I'll see how I can bait you. And then I'm going to, and then I'm going to toy with you. So none of this is valid. This was all fake. And the client was quite nervous by it, didn't know what to do, and wasn't sure how to handle this. So luckily, she was sent it to her, her boss because she was like, I don't know what's happening here. And so they were able to navigate that challenge together because it was pretty uncomfortable for this client to be able to figure out what this was about. So I have a question for you. Would you report this to your boss if you received one of these emails? Again, just put your phone up there, scan the QR code and let me know. Would you feel comfortable? Because again, essentially this hacker was really trying to exploit this particular person in the dirtiest, most ignorant form possible. Would some of you feel uncomfortable to approach your boss with that? Because, you know, there is that, you know, you could be, you could feel like maybe I did do something wrong. 
So maybe I am in trouble. So um, most of you say you would report that to your boss, and I would recommend you do um, because you might, you might, you might know that John Merrill is not a real human, but you might think, well, what if it is a real person, and what if they're really going to exploit me? I was um, my boyfriend a few years ago got a social media attack on Facebook, and they exploited him in the most cruelest, cruelest way. And he thought they were real people and the whole time they weren't. And so it could be very deceiving. And so we just want to know that, want you to know that it is okay to report it to your boss, even if it's the smallest thing, like uh, here's a gift card, click on this link, you can get $25. Your boss has just issued this to you. If, it, if you doubt it, you get to delete it for sure. So right now, what we're finding is these type of breaches, if you were to respond to that hacker, he can then have, you know, essentially free reign inside of your company. And the impact is that your company has to be shut down. Your company possibly could have damage to their reputation because they have to let their clients know. They have to let their staff know. And then they have to let possible stakeholders know. And then if it's a big enough breach, they have to let the media know and, enforce, and uh, law enforcement. And then there's unpredictable expenses. So um, I'll talk about unpredictable expenses in this ransomware. Ransomware is the new type of attack, not new, sorry, more common. It's been around for a while, but it's becoming more and more prevalent because it's effective. And essentially they're taking your data and they're kidnapping it and saying, we're going to lock down your system and you're going to have to pay us. So let's say, Crystal, you're, you log on to your computer tomorrow and you can't get on. And then you, call your boss. You're like, I can't log on. Nothing seems to work. And he says, I can't either. And then you find out no one in your company can log on. That is what's happened. Hacker, usually these are organized criminals who will lock your systems down, every single one of them, and not give you access. And they'll give you a pop-up screen that says, we are in your network, have stolen your data, and we will no longer give you access to anything in your network until you pay us $500,000 by, you know, let's say Tuesday. You're just going to make up an arbitrary date, an arbitrary number. And you don't know who they are. You don't know why they did this to you. And you don't know how to stop them. And the truth of the matter is you can't stop them. And secondly, you can't find them. So this is where law enforcement has to get involved because they have to help you negotiate. Because what you're dealing with is you're dealing with a, a, a gang that has hired a collective group of people who have different specialized skills that can execute this type of crime on your organization. And you'd be like, but why my company? We, we're just a small little healthcare company or a law firm. And you're like, that's not the point. They're gonna target you because they found one way to get inside your organization. And now they have full reign and they found confidential data that they know they can use against you. So if you were to say, I have all my client records, let's say you have your health, their health care number, or you have banking information, they have, can steal that and they say, we have it. Do you want it back? If you want it back, you have to pay us. If you, if you don't pay us, we're going to sell it because it is such big business now that you are now susceptible to this new market that is called the dark web. So you can buy socks on Amazon. Well, now you can sell data on the dark web. Not you, but they can. And right now, people, organizations all over the US have had been victim to it. And in the first half of 2021, 590 million has been paid out to ransomware gangs. Now there's all sorts of ransomware gangs out there. Right now, Lapsus is the biggest one and they're coming with fierce, different ones that pop up. Some um, have different tactics, but they're organized. They're sophisticated. They know what they're doing. They know how to get in, get what they want, and not be traced. So this leaves us at the mercy of them. And there, there's no shame in this because every single organization is getting hit between the Uber, the Cisco, every type of organization is getting hit. And the numbers are increasing to healthcare and public school systems are on the rise. And again, they're, what, what would be the benefit from that? And it's the idea that it's the data that's confidential, that you or I 
would never want to be released to the public because then that in turn equals identity theft. So if my social insurance number is stolen and it's sold on the dark web, then I have to go essentially get a new one or I have to watch to make sure mine isn't sold on the dark web or used by somebody else for harm, which more than likely it would be. So there's a whole domino effect to what occurs there if data was stolen from your company. So just to give you some perspective, right now we have, you know, 4% of the internet is our surface where we can go shop online at Amazon or go look at, you know, YouTube videos or do our work. Uh, then there's the deep web, which is 90%. And that's where I would give you an example of an investigative reporter will do uh, inform uh, intel, uh, trade intel there. Uh, so it's not discovered or it's not uh, found or retrieved or removed. And then we have the dark web and it's at 6% right now. So that's a marketplace, specifically a marketplace where hackers set up a marketplace like Amazon and sell their products. So one active marketplace is called the Royal Market. Right now it is currently active. Now, FBI and all sorts of uh, law enforcement agencies are trying to take down these marketplaces and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. They cannot take them down. So they have all sorts of intel and they're trying to take them down and they take them one at a time. So Alpha Bay Market was one that was taken down a few years ago, but then it just reared up again and now it's called Alpha Bay 2. So they're they're just, they're unstoppable. Cut off a snake's head, and up comes another one is, a, is what we're really up against. So we're dealing with very serious criminals who have the gain to make millions and they're going to do everything they can to make millions. So this marketplace, you can see funny, some of it's funny because it's not clear, sorry about that, but you know, they're selling stimulants, they're selling steroids, they're selling prescription drugs. I mean, so it is a real huge marketplace for drugs and it is a successful, successful marketplace to sell drugs all over the world. However, you will see the top column, it says counterfeit. It says digital. And then the other column, it says fraud. Those are the pieces of data that would be sold that could be from your organization or a client, or it could be credit cards, social insurance numbers, email, all of it is up for sale. So you can see this marketplace sells this for fun. And then there'll be buyers. There's always buyers. So there's big money to be exchanged here at the price of cost of you and your organization as you pay the price because you can't find them. You can't stop them and you can't retrieve that data unless they decide to give it back to you. What we're finding though, is they're not giving them back the data properly anyway. So you could have cyber insurance and they'll only give you back 40% of that data. It could be just uh, absolutely messed up. So the, you don't even win in the end. Uh, it's unfortunate. So this is why we encourage you to bring in negotiators to negotiate with these ransomware gangs because their ask is absolutely impossible. Could your organization afford to pay a $500,000 fee tomorrow just to get your data back? Because the, the numbers are arbitrary. They'll just make up numbers. We want this much money given to us in Bitcoin by this day or else. So their threat is real. They do have your data. They are going to sell it. That isn't the problem. The problem is, is what do you do? Can you afford that? And could you afford to tell your clients that? Could you afford to tell your stakeholders that? And could you stay in business? And that's the question you have to ask yourself is, are you ready for that? Because this is really truly what most organizations have to truly face. So in May, Regina Public School was hacked. They had a ransomware attack. Regina Public School, like a school in the middle of nowhere. And they were, they were breached. And so they had to do the same thing. They had to hire investigators. They had to hire forensic analysts. They had to, they had to pay out a whack load of money because they had no idea what happened, how to stop them, but all their systems were down. So it's close to home for us because it's happening in the thing, in areas that we would never, ever have suspected. Even as security professionals, we're just like, what? why are you hacking a school? That's so weird. But it's the data, the SIN numbers, the names, the email addresses. It all has value in the marketplace in the dark web. So 
we want to talk to you about how we can take this problem and reformulate it as a solution to be preventative. We have to work as a preventative measure because the outcome is too costly. Most companies can't afford those high costs of hiring, you know, forensic analysts that are like 250 an hour, uh, investigators who take two months to figure out where the problem is and you can't be up and running and you have to use paper and pen for days and days and days on end. And then your clients are mad because they can't do business with you properly. The problems are endless, essentially, for you. So we think if you can look at it from a preventative approach, you could avoid all of those problems that you can't even predict. Those are just some examples. That isn't actually every example. Sometimes they're worse. So let's talk about that. What would that look like for you? So we believe one of the biggest targets is you. You're the human. Um, you're vulnerable because you are important inside of your organization. You are valuable. The work you do is important and you make a difference. And your company has you there because of the work you can do that does add value. However, the hackers know that now too. They find you are the most vulnerable. You're the easiest target. So we want to approach it with build a human firewall, you, you individually. And you can, you know, link arms with your other staff members and you can be a united front to be able to have the same knowledge, same approach and same awareness to be able to say, how do we have a security minded workplace so that we can know we're doing the right things individually that we can do? Again, there's all sorts of problems around this. Software is a problem. Technology is a problem. You know, I, I'm not saying that it isn't just humans. It's just that I want to talk to you today about what you can do on that face, because there's other aspects that an organization has to take in um, measures they have to take into place as well, um, take measures towards. So your staff have to be trained. They have to know. They have to understand. Phishing is here to stay. Uh, malicious links are here to stay. Malicious attachments are here to stay. Uh, fake phone calls are here to stay. Fake texts are here to stay. Your company being vulnerable, here to stay. It's a new norm. Your business costs will probably have to rise just a little bit because you have to take these measures. You just don't have a choice. It's the new way of securing your digital assets, just like we talked about securing your, your money in a bank. Uh, so the, the, the enforcing the security policy so everyone understands what do we all do together so we're united so we understand what we're up against because there's a new threat to our organization. It isn't just your, your a fire or water damage or those kind of physical aspects that company would have initially prepared for. Right now, we know 88% of cyber incidents are caused by uninformed employees. So it's not your fault. You don't know what you don't know. And, that, and that's the whole point. These hackers are sophisticated. They're trying every which way to be able to trick you. And that's not anything you could prepare for to go, oh, I didn't know I'd be a main target. I have a lot of people that talk, I talk to that just go, well, what, what would it matter about me? I'm just doing my work. And it's a legitimate statement. But we want you to know now that you can take measures and be have a different level of accountability in the way you approach your day-to-day -day work. Like we're talking as soon as you log on to your computer, you take a whole new approach as you're securing your organization and your organization's assets because you're an asset to that organization. So everything you do matters, everything you touch matters, and everything you transfer or interact with matters. And so some of you might have way more confidential data that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis than others. But remember, emails are just as, as crucial as SIN numbers because data is data to these hackers. It can be sold on the dark web. It has value. So we we uh, we talk about implement implementing um, modern authentication. Uh, password manager is one easy easy way to do this. But outside of that, if you don't use a password manager, then you find yourself stuck. And what I mean by stuck is you're like, well, I have a password for everything I have to access because that is the way we work with our digital assets. It's like you have a key for your house and a key for your car. You don't have the same key for your car as you do for your house, right? Well, now we have to have a key for our digital assets, and that is our password. And we have two levels of security that we can add to this so that we can do the right thing individually, and that is using a password manager. 
because outside of it, we will reuse our passwords. How many of you use your passwords in more than one account, two accounts, three accounts? It's so easy to do because why would you want to memorize more than the numerous accounts that you have to? Because the average person has about 90 accounts that they have passwords for. So all those apps that you set up for, those all have passwords. It doesn't matter what app. So you're just inundated with pass passwords and it's impossible to remember them all. So you don't. And that's fair. We're human. Why would we want it? I know it's a bane of my existence. So I use a password manager. And there's many out there. LastPass is one really good one. And it basically takes a password and it encrypts it for you so that you don't have to remember it. And it creates passwords for you, new passwords. So whenever you're setting up a new account, it can set up a password for you. And then you can launch, launch that website every single time with LastPass. So it does a little bit of the heavy lifting for you. And it also gives you ease of access. And once you start using it, you find it's really quite easy. And it only takes a few seconds of your day each time you're logging on to a new account to utilize this type of logging on process. It's really quite amenable because then you get to just go, I'm not using the same password anymore. And I have to not think about passwords ever again. Just have to remember one master password, which is the last pass account. And that has to be a complicated one. And that's it. So we, you know, we know single sign-on is great, but that is only for certain um, software. It isn't for every software that you log into. So you still have other passwords you have to remember. So this takes away the headache and the burden of what passwords are for us. And then more importantly, if you have any compromise, like your Facebook account gets compromised or any email, you have to change a password immediately. Immediately, that is just a, a first step and, and must do. Then the other thing is, is that we have multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication you already use and are very familiar with. We know this because you have, whether you have a tax account, for example, or you have other banking accounts that have made that mandatory, you're familiar with it. So it's, it's something you, you would use like a password, something you have like a trusted device or your fingerprint. So my computer, I use a fingerprint, for example. My phone, I use my face. So you're, you're very familiar with different ways of uh, adding a security to prove it's you. What we're saying now is you need to enable that on all of your work devices. Because if you are having a breach because a hacker did steal your password, they can't get into your account because they have this other layer that stops them. And that says, hey, are you logging onto your Office 365 SharePoint account? No, I'm not. I'm having dinner right now. <laughs> so then you can know that's not you. And you can deny, deny, and deny. And even if, you, if this hacker is incessant, then that means you have a problem. You can then call your boss and say, something's fishy here. Uh, someone's trying to get into my work account and um, they keep pushing my multi-factor authentication. And so then you know, right? So it's just one way of you knowing it's not you accessing it. And also, you know, when you're accessing it, it's verified by you. The other thing is, is that Wi-Fi is very common. We're using Wi-Fi everywhere, travel, go to the airport, hotels, doing work remotely, uh, coffee shops, you name it. So I just want to caution you to, to know one thing. Don't do any confidential work on a Wi-Fi network. Don't do any banking. Don't do any transferring of confidential data on a Wi-Fi network. Because Wi-Fi networks are easily compromised. People, hackers will come in and just essentially they'll copy your that Starbucks and then pretend they're Starbucks. And then you think you're logging onto Starbucks Wi-Fi and it's not Starbucks. And then they're stealing all of the information you're logging into. So they are not secure and you know they're not secure, but I'm telling you that they're you're vulnerable if you do anything confidential. So you would have to be very careful. Just watch videos, whatever, you know, read your books, but don't do anything confidential work or banking related. Always just use VPN, which is a virtual private network or use your own data. And then when it comes to phishing, the one thing I just wanna to stress to you is you can do two things when it comes to something you see around phishing. If you doubt it, verify it. Go outside of that source, whether it's a text or a phone or it's a email, 
verify. If your boss is asking you to send something, call them up. Say, did you actually ask for this? And they'll go, what are you talking about? Not at all. Then you know. Then you get to just delete it. It's that simple. All you have to do is delete it. These are these hackers send out such mass campaigns, they're not going to be offended that you delete it. They're not going to go, oh, I'm going to bug her again and again, bug you again. But this isn't anything personal. So you just have to be on the lookout for these really commonplace things. Like everything is going to look real. The logos are going to look real. The, um, the email, you have to look and see, is it real? Because that they can trick you by saying, oh, this is so-and-so. But then the email address is a weird email address. So if you take, I would say, five to 10 seconds just to scan the email, every email that you would doubt, and make sure it has the proper email address. Double check the spelling. If there's bad spelling, that's a dead giveaway. And then over the link, if you have a link sent from a trusted coworker, just hover over it. The trick of hovering over an email link is that it shows what it is. If it says, um, if it's a SharePoint link or if it's going to be a malicious link, it'll tell you. So then you know, hmm, I have to delete this email. This is, uh, you know, malicious intent. And more than anything, notice gift cards because gift cards are a really common thing to be pushing out right now to employees. So just be very leery of those. And especially as you're shopping online over the holidays, be very careful not to save your passwords in the browser. Be careful not to save your credit card information in the accounts and be careful and make sure you have multi-factor authentication enabled on all those accounts as well, because this is where ha hackers are going to be rampant right in this season. And then when you're securing your work environment, when you enable these things, these will give you this, the assurance that you're doing your part. And that's all you can do, right? You can be accountable for so, only so many things. And that's what we're asking is these are the steps you can take starting today so that you can feel like, yeah, I'm following the best practices as, as an employee that I know I can do every day with every application I'm, I'm working in. And so, for example, when we talk about this checklist, what we're saying is every time you see a software update coming from your phone or your computer or your soft, uh, any other, like especially Microsoft, date it immediately. Um, you have to use a WPA2 or 3 for your Wi-Fi network. Uh, using a virtual private network is always valuable if you're going to use that um, outside of your office. So if your company has that, use that. Um, and then caution to those downloads. Just again, just verify and don't hesitate to doubt, uh, to delete because it just takes a few seconds and then you can just move on. And then if you can talk about this inside of your organization about what that would look like for having more security addressed inside your company, whether you have policies, whether you have a different approach about, okay, well, let's all implement a password manager. Let's all implement multi-factor authentication. But today, set up a password manager. Today, enable um, um, five new accounts that have, you know, five critical accounts, your banking and your work. Change those passwords and, and, and add them to your password manager so that you can know, okay, well, fresh start. I can, do, I can do five for now. And then you can just add more as you go so that you can feel comfortable with the new application. Because we, have, we add new apps to our, our phones all the time. So it's not a, a challenge to add a new app. It's just a matter of making this part of your day-to-day -day process. And then for your um, antivirus, making sure you have that on your managed device, the device that you're given to from work. And then for your multi-factor multi -factor authentication, maybe just start with five critical accounts. If that's so, it's not so overwhelming to you, but after today's session, go enable multi-factor authentication with all your work and your banking accounts, because those are very critical accounts, I believe. And then get a feel for it. See, it doesn't take much time, a few extra seconds to just verify it's you, a few extra seconds to use a proper password. And then you're in securely and you've done your part. And then if you have any challenges with this, then you can rely on IT professionals like Smart Dolphins that can help you with these remote setups so that every staff member has the right configuration and setup so that everyone is following the same protocols and understands why they're doing this and why and when they're doing this. And again, it's just every day you log on, you follow these protocols, then you're keeping the hackers at bay that much more by the steps you're taking to keep your 
asset and your company and your and you're just your work secure. And the main reason we do this is to maintain and keep and retain customer trust. They're trusting you right now. They they have they do services with you. They buy your products. They understand you're giving them something of value. What does break their trust is to find out their data was leaked. Uh, every client would respond the same way. Just think if you had this happen to you, and maybe some of you have had this happen to you. Whether you've had your credit card stolen and you have your credit card company telling you, uh, we have some authorized transactions on your credit card, but they took care of you right away and they were able to tell you your card has been compromised. We're going to give you a new credit card. That's retaining customer trust because they knew right away something was wrong and they took care of it right away. And they didn't say, oh, $2,000 bill, $2, bill on your credit card, you're going to have to pay that bill. No, they understand what they're up against. This is a business cost for them. They're having hackers trying to breach their systems every minute of every day because they are the gatekeepers of money and confidential data. So you have to know that they're doing their part. But now as an organization, you realize you have the same responsibility and what it is that you can do as an individual for your organization. And that's worth the conversation with your boss and your team, your leadership team, because if this occurred, what would your clients do? And you don't want to lose your clients. And then for you, can you leave here to be a security champion? Can you be curious enough to ask these questions and say, what can we do differently? How can we secure our organization differently? What would make us prevent, prevent, protect us from any hacker? Maybe there's nothing that's protecting us from a hacker right now. So then it's just a matter of time before it does happen. And when it does happen, you won't even know what to do either, because if you don't know how to manage these security measures, the breach will be overwhelming to you. The clients I'm working with that are handling a breach, they don't understand any of it, not one bit. And so they're needing step-by-step -step guidance on this is who you call, this is what you write down, this is what you need to ask. And they don't even understand the, the scale of the breach and the outcome of it. And so it's scary because they're in foreign, they're in foreign territory and they are having to go to breach specialists to help them through this, hoping it will help them through this, trying to keep this quiet so they can go, okay, is this, is this manageable or is this a big breach? How big of it is? So the investigation is, is ongoing so that they don't have that answer and they're going to have to wait until they get that answer. And then they have to tell their clients and then they have to figure out how they navigate that challenge. So this is real, and this is a challenge for every organization, and I, and I really hope that today's session, you can see which ways you can make an impact to help your organization. And, and trust me, your leadership would be grateful for this, because they're not going to be any more knowledgeable in this, because they haven't had to think about it. It's not, it, they're running their business, and that's what they're thinking about, right? Not thinking about, oh, I have to now secure my business. So for you, let's talk about ways of changing the way we secure our data. And just like we don't put our money under a mattress, we don't need to act like we will, you know, all our data is secure and fine just the way it is. We have to change the way we approach our business and our needs, just like we now invest our money in banking institutions and we don't, and we trust them. And we, we trust that these are solid organizations that can give us the support and the resources we need. So. With that being said, that closes up the information I wanted to share with you today, but I would love to have some questions from you that if you need some more clarification on anything that I spoke about earlier today, happy to be able to spell that out a bit more or talk in more detail. I'll leave uh, it to you. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, nothing in the chat, but uh, no. do feel free to chime in if you do have a question you're holding on to. I have a question. Yeah, yes. go, go ahead. Um, so just wanted to confirm if, if you receive an email that's phishing, it's not that sometimes I get a little freaked out about that. It's not that you, you can click into it um, to view it, but it's when you respond or reply or whether you click into something that is really the problem. Is that correct? 
Right. Like you can easily open up an email. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Opening yeah. it up to say, okay, what's this email? Yeah. You can yeah. open it up for sure. Cause again, that's, there's no harm in opening up the email to say, oh, okay, this is from John Merrill and you're scanning the email. And when you're scanning the email, that's when you're going, okay, that's, I don't know that name. I don't know that email address. Okay. Red flag. Number one, spelling is crappy. Red flag. Number two, a weird link. Okay. Hover over the link. Mm flag number three, and then an attachment. Or th this one particular email I showed you earlier, there was no attachment. There was just a threat. So the threat was the bait to respond. So there's going to be different ways for them to bait you. And so you can just take that d email and you can delete it. Right. Okay. And that's, that's all you have to do. Okay. And um, this might be a smart dolphins question, but I have like set up on mine for the direct link to report you just click the one little um so is that like where when that kind of came into play is when we had like our president chris when i got an email from him and it was obviously it was phishing whatever um is that do smart dolphins want us to do that for every single one that comes through or just sort of company related ones like that Ooh, good, good question. Um, yeah, I would say if it's suspicious, uh, yeah, go ahead and report it. Um, more data is definitely, definitely useful uh, for us. Um, and if it's like, if it's something especially, you know, sort of over the norm, um, feel free to actually send that into our support at smartdolphins.com um, uh, email address. Or if you're just not sure, you know, um, we often have clients see something and like, I don't know, this, this might be legit. It might not. Um, feel free to send it to us and we can we can weigh in on it as well. So yeah, yeah, don't don't be shy. We we don't mind hearing about that stuff. Okay, perfect. And last question, can you explain a bit more that password manager? Like how exactly does that work? Sonia? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a quite an easy application to install. So you can choose to um have two options. You can choose just for your one, a one device and it's free, or if you choose multiple, multiple devices, it's a monthly fee. But once you download that, it then gives you the steps to follow. So it says, okay, set up a master password. That is a very complicated password. Only you remember it, only you know it. And then once you open up that application, it will then give you this vault. And essentially you're opening up a vault and it's basically giving you options. You can create a password, you can save passwords, you can save, um, all other confidential information like your passport or whatever like that. And so it's this vault that will then help you going forward. So if you save it, if you save it on your computer and you create it as a, an option on your computer so that it can sync with your device, it will then help you create a password and then it saves that password. And then it asks you, do you want us to help you log on to that site going forward? And you say yes, and then it will help you. You go, uh, you log on to, let's say, um, Office 365. Then it will go, oh, you need this password, and it will help you autofill it. So it's all done securely, of course. I know this sounds hard to believe, but truly it is securely. And then it'll help you launch into your Office 365 account because you have a secure password in there, and you've uh, uh, approved them to be able to help you save that password to launch it through that secure encrypted um third party um password manager i can okay. i can comment on the the security side of it as well a bit um so the way it works is is actually pretty ingenious um as sonia mentioned when you set it up you create what, what's called a master password right and that master password um through a bunch of math is used to basically encrypt or scramble the rest of your passwords but the way it works is that last pass or you know companies like them, they don't actually know the master password. Um, so what that actually means is, is if you ever lose your master password, they actually can't get you back into your account. Um, they can't reset it. They can't, you know, extract the data for you. They, they, it, it's based on something like a concept called zero knowledge, where they provide the service, but you have that key, right? So it's actually a really important concept. You don't want to lose that master password because you're you're pretty hooped if you do, but it means that mm -hmm. if somebody if somebody were to breach LastPass or a company like them, um, they don't have that, right? So that can't get out into the wild. Um, 
and another comment too is there are corporate versions of these these password management systems. Um, they're really great, you know, for personal use. I use one, um, but companies that want to be able to manage corporate passwords can actually do that in a centralized way um, and be able to like delegate passwords. And there's a lot more to it. It's it's just now starting to become more common in the corporate world. And there's a bit of work, uh, you know, to get those set up. But it might be something to sort of, uh, you know, consider internally as well. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. A pleasure. Well, I hope that's helped everybody. If you have any other questions, we're going to send out a survey and a follow up email. You can definitely just uh, inquire for more information through that channel as well. We really thank you for being here today.